The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. Hello, I'm Ray Lemura, and welcome to this edition of Cable Reports from the General Assembly. Our guest today is Senate Majority Leader Tommy Norman. Welcome, Senator. Ray, good morning. It's very nice to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Great. Senator, tell us a little bit about your district. Uh, wow. My district is quite interesting. As a result of redistricting, I like to euphemistically say that my Democratic friends gave me the opportunity to make a lot of new friends. <laughs> uh, my district now extends almost from the North Carolina line just to the outskirts of Richmond. It includes uh, 11 jurisdictions. I'm not even sure I can remember them all, but uh, I'll try. Uh, King and Queen County, King William, Gloucester County, part of James City County, part of York County, part of the city of Hampton, part of Surrey, part of Isle of Wight, part of Smithfield, and part of Suffolk. That's pretty close to, to what it is. So I have lots, lots of pieces, uh, and it's been very interesting. But I've met a lot of very nice people, and and so I'm, I'm thankful to my Democratic friends for giving me that opportunity. Right. Now, how does you go about trying to represent a district that large? Is you getting in the car and hitting every uh, local government? And well, it really is challenging, Ray, and, and that's not one of the considerations when we go through redistricting. And I say that without a partisan tone whatsoever. Uh, redistricting is supposed to consider such things as compactness, contiguousness, and communities of interest. And the community of interest is what I find very, very challenging. Uh, I have part of Hampton, downtown Hampton, uh, which like many metropolitan areas has its inner city issues. And then I have uh, King and Queen County, which has maybe got 6,400 people in it, uh, agricultural, arrogant, uh, arrogant based, um, wonderful people, but just have very different qualities of life and focus than, than downtown Hampton. So what you find is trying to cross those jurisdictional boundaries to, to represent uh, the entire district. And it, so it's not just a, a, a geological issue, it, it, it's uh, it really the, the approaches to life. Uh, I remember the first time I went to King William, they were having a gathering down on the Mattapatai River. And of course, in some of these rural counties, it's difficult to get a critical mass of people together. So I was really excited. And I remember leaving there at 9.30 at night and thinking I was 61 miles from my home. And then I got to thinking, well, how far was Suffolk past my home? So uh, you just have to work very hard um, and you, you have to be accessible. Uh, you have to introduce yourself to the, the new constituents. And you have to encourage them to understand because of... Uh, the district means so spread out that sometimes they're going to have to communicate with your assistants. So you just have to work at it. All right. Well, with someone with your tenure here and your experience, you actually are, uh, it, it, they're very fortunate to have a, a senator uh, with your experience who can meld all those issues because you've been around here so long to have heard so many of the debates affecting so many of those type of communities. Well, I hope that uh, those communities are appreciative of what I, I try to do. Uh, I, I do to try to find those communities of interest in those issues that are universally applicable to you, whether you're an inner city or a rural jur jurisdiction. Uh, there are those that have said, I've been around for 20 years too long, and there's some mornings I wake up and think they're right. <laughs> uh, this doesn't happen to be one of them, though. Um, but I, certainly experience helps. Uh, I tell young senators and uh, newly elected delegates that much of what you learn here in Richmond is on-the-job training or OJT. There is no manual that you can go to that can give you the, the insight and the, the experience. Uh, this really is baptism by, by fire, and you, you have to be immersed in the, the process. And generally, uh, I, I, it takes longer than a year to, to figure things out. So if nothing else, uh, I've been exposed to it for a lot of years. I think I understand the process, and I understand the importance of having bipartisan relationships. No legislator can accomplish anything in Richmond if they're an island unto themselves. All right. 
Uh, tell us a little about uh, the universities and colleges in your community. Well, Ray, I've been a tireless and unabashed advocate of higher education for many years. I happen to believe that uh, education, whether it's K through 12 or higher education, really is the door to success in life. And I believe that those opportunities for education should be universally available. Uh, in the district that I have the privilege of representing, uh, of course, I have a Thomas Nelson Community College, which has two campuses. They have one in Hampton and then what they refer to as the Northern or Historic Campus in Williamsburg. Uh, the uh, Thomas Nelson Campus in Williamsburg has an extraordinary dental hygienist program that is remarkable. I went through it not long ago and they actually have these these dummy patients made up where uh, the dental hygienist can even learn how to administer noble cane shots and oh if they God. miss the <laughs> miss the mark then the then the then the, the uh, robot will react to it um, I uh, also uh, have a Rappahannock Community College over there uh, in the uh, Middle Peninsula area and as a result of redistricting, uh, they did divest me of the city of Williamsburg, which is still perplexing to me. And I say that because for four years, I've been teaching over at the College of William and Mary. Um, so I do still consider myself uh, the steward of the College of William and Mary. I obtained my law degree there and actually grew up in Williamsburg. So uh, I tell people, even though I went to VMI, that out of my left arm, I do bleed green and gold. <laughs> Uh, so uh, uh, we have some wonderful uh, two-year and four-year institutions in our area. Great. How about some of the major employers in the district? Well, major employers, that's a really interesting question, Ray. Uh, I represent the historic triangle. Uh, consequently, we're highly dependent upon the tourism and visitor industry. Uh, that is really a hallmark, but we have other major employers. College of William & Mary is a very significant employer. Uh, Eastern State Hospital, uh, the oldest uh, institution for the mentally disabled in the country as a significant employer. Uh, we have uh, Anheuser-Busch, which is of course now owned by InBev, uh, but we have the beer manufacturing plant, uh, which is a significant employer. Uh, we also have the seasonal employees uh, at Water Country USA and Bush Gardens. I mean, Bush Gardens and Water Country are very significant seasonal employees. Um, so they are some of the, the major employees that, employers that we have. And then, of course, Colonial Williamsburg is probably the largest individual uh, em employer there. And that's not just seasonal. That's a, a year-round uh, employment base. So very much a tourism-based um, economy. Uh, for years, it's been an effort to diversify. We have some smaller manufacturing facilities. but. I would say tourism and the Anheuser-Busch, uh, Water Country, Busch Gardens presence are the predominant ones. Great. Um, now, as session is, is um, in the heat of, uh, of debate on numer numerous issues, how about some of the legislation you've carried uh, this session? Well, it's almost an embarrassing question this year, Ray. Uh, uh, historically, I have carried a pretty significant legislative load it was not uncommon for me to have 30 or 40 pieces of legislation, many of them of significance. I consciously made the decision this year that I was not going to carry very much legislation. I, regretfully, I had to tell a lot of people no, that I just could not do it this year. Uh, and the reason is, is pretty simple. Uh, one is I knew that uh, as a result of retirements that on the Senate Finance Committee I was going to be the number two ranking Republican. I've been a budget conferee for the last two years. I fully expected to be a budget conferee this year. With Senator Stosh taking over the chairmanship of that committee, I knew that he was going to be relying upon me very heavily to assist him. And that takes an incredible amount of time. I think the average citizen just has no idea of literally the hundreds of hours that we as legislators invest in the budget. The other reason that I've carried a very light legislative load this year is because I am the majority leader of the Senate. We've just come off an election cycle. I'm trying to develop both cohesiveness and a consensus within the Senate Republican Caucus. Uh, because of the ideological diversity we have, that is not an easy task. 
so I knew it was going to take a lot of energy and a lot of focus and a lot of time to lead that caucus. And then, of course, I, I do uh, conduct the leadership on the floor of the Senate. I control the flow of the legislation, and that's taken a lot of time. So I didn't carry as much legislation. Uh, much of what I am carrying uh, is uh, pretty benign by historical standards. I've carried some bills that are dealing with the transparency of the budget. If somebody inserts something into the budget, then they ought to take credit for it. So I want their their identity and the item that they've inserted in the budget disclosed so that the general public knows what's gone on there. Uh, I carried some legislation for health care providers that uh, have continuing care retirement communities. Uh, and these are frequently developing around uh, the Williamsburg area because of just sort of the ambience that many people come there and retire. Uh, but this was legislation that allowed these continuing care retirement communities to package a menu of health care services that would be delivered to the, the residents there. Uh, perhaps not exciting as some of the issues that we're dealing with legislatively, but very important to, to those communities. Uh, but not a, not a historical year for me, but I'm very comfortable with the decision I made. And with two weeks to go, I'm particularly comfortable because the uh, challenges on my time and organization are really uh, at an apex right now. Well, your time is, you are spread uh, really thin. Um, you are on all the key committees in the Senate. Why don't you tell our viewers the, the committees that you serve on? Well, it's been very interesting. When I first was elected in 1991 and my first session was 1992, the Democrats uh, control the governor's mansion, they control the House of Delegates, and they control the Senate. And even though I was elected as a moderate Republican, most of the personal and professional relationships I had were with Democrats who were in the General Assembly. I'm an attorney by profession and uh, people like Alan Diamondstein and Hunter Andrews have been friends of mine for many years. The good thing is that they looked out for me in those early years. Uh, so for 20 years, I've been on the Courts of Justice Committee. Uh, the Courts of Justice Committee deals with legislation that's both criminal and civil. And also, we determine the qualifications of judges. Individuals who want to be judges, we interview them and determine whether or not they're qualified. I currently have the privilege of chairing the Courts of Justice Committee. They also put me on the Commerce and Labor Committee in the Senate structure. That's the second most influential committee, I think, in the Senate. I've been there for 20 years, and uh, I am the senior Republican on that committee. Uh, that committee deals with all legislation pertaining to banking, insurance, workman's compensation, unemployment, issues that are incredibly important to the business community, so we get a lot of attention there. And for over a decade, I've been on the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, that's a committee that you don't so short circuit on and nobody anoints you to go on early on in your career. Uh, I used to joke with people that I was the majority leader and the floor leader of the Senate before I ever got on the Finance Committee. And people <laughs> would laugh at me. Uh, but I have been uh, on there for a decade. Uh, I am uh, the second senior member on the Finance Committee. Uh, I chair the subcommittee on on education, which deals with K through 12 and also higher education. So I've been very blessed, Ray. I really have. Uh, I had friends that looked out for me on the front end. They had enough confidence that maybe I could survive the, the legislative wars. And so I've been able to stay on these committees for some period of time, which just through osmosis has, has taught me a lot. Uh, tell us about your role as majority leader on top of all this committee work you have to do as well. The, the ever-evolving role <laughs> of the majority leader. Now, this has been a particularly partisan and contentious year. As a result of the November elections, we ended up with 20 Democratic senators and 20 Republican senators. I knew that the immediate challenge in the Senate was going to be the organization of it on the very first day. I was not disappointed in that expectation. Uh, there was a lot of rhetoric and demagoguery about committee assignments and who was in charge and who wasn't in charge. Uh, I was an English history major at, at VMI, so that should scare people. Um, but I can count to 21, and I knew that 20 Republican senators plus uh, Bill Bowling as a Republican lieutenant governor equal 21. 
Um, so the Republicans have been uh, running and monitoring uh, the Senate. It has taken a great deal of time because of the even divide of, of 2020. Uh, there are certain issues that the lieutenant governor cannot vote on. Uh, I compliment Lieutenant Governor Bowling because he came out very early with a memorandum and articulated clearly what he was going to vote on and those issues that he would not vote on. And the reason I, I mention that to you and to our viewers is that on those issues where it requires a majority of the members elected, which excludes the lieutenant governor, we have to build a consensus. Uh, and it's certainly very well known right now, and the media has been covering it, that uh, we did not pass the Senate budget. The Senate budget required 21 senators, or a majority of these senators elected, so 21 out of 40. Uh, the Democrats voted as a block against the budget. The curious thing was they didn't vote against the budget because they didn't like the budget. They voted against the budget because they were still annoyed from the opening day where they didn't get some of the committee assignments that they thought they should. And the reason I point that out is not to stress the partisanship of it, but there are certain issues out there that, that are very contentious uh, that my Democratic colleagues have a bruised political ego over, and so they make a fight over it. Um, and there are those issues that we can report out with 20 Republican senators plus the lieutenant governor, but constitutional amendments we cannot, and the budget we cannot. Uh, so we're on a collision course right now as a result of bruised political egos and partisanship to possibly not have a budget in Virginia. That is not insignificant. Uh, and so it's taken a great deal of time to engage uh, in, I would say, diplomacy, where I'm talking to my Democratic friends, trying to address some of the concerns that they have. And there's a great deal of time being put on brinkmanship. That's a question about, is somebody going to blink? And I think it's really a disservice, frankly, to the citizens of Virginia. And this, I will admit, this is a little bit of a partisan comment. Um, I think it's a disservice to the citizens of Virginia. My Democratic friends are saying we're not voting for a budget, not because it's not good. In fact, uh, they voted for all of the budget amendments. Every amendment to the budget, every Democrat in the Senate voted for. They did not offer one amendment to the entire budget. Uh, and they did not pull out one amendment when we were reviewing the budget on the floor of the Senate to discuss. They just voted against it, and the reason was we didn't get the committee assignments that we want. I don't think Virginians have much tolerance for that. Um, and I think as we push up on uh, May the 1st, and the reason I say May the 1st is local governments must adopt their budgets by the 1st of May, if you don't think that local governments aren't going to get nervous if we don't have a budget when they don't know how much state funding is coming to their schools, uh, to their social service programs, to those safety net programs, uh, I, th I think you're mistaken. And I don't think Virginians are going to want to hear, we don't have a budget because I didn't get on a certain committee. I, I may be wrong. I'm wrong every day, but I don't think I'm wrong on this one, Ray. <laughs> well, you, you talk about all that work that goes into the budget. Tell us a little bit about what a great budget you produced uh, this um, so far. I have to compliment Senator Walter Stosh from Henrico, who's the Senate Finance Chairman. He has done a marvelous job of constructing and shepherding through the construction of a Senate budget. Uh, I think it is one of the finest budgets that I've seen in my 21 years up here. Uh, you hear complaints that money was taken away from education. The governor put significant new money back into the budget for K-12 through public education. The Senate put an, an additional amount of $165 million into K-12 through education over and above what the, the governor put in. And to hear these cries of, hey, you're taking money away from public education, and that's why we don't like the, the budget is a farce. Um, I had to remind my Democratic friends, you guys were in charge in 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011 when funding was cut to public education. We weren't in charge. You guys cut it. Uh, so we put a lot of money in public education, which is good. Higher education has been pounded in recent years. Uh, they have been cut substantially. 
we put new money into higher education. But I think most importantly, when we were going through the budget crisis as a result of the re re uh, recession, that we actually had to cut funding to some of these safety net programs. When I say safety net, I'm talking programs where people, because of their own limitations, rely upon the state to give them some form of public assistance. Um, and we cut some of those programs. And this Senate budget restored an awful lot of money to like your free health care clinics. Uh, I think many of them are very anxious out there. We're going to get money from the state this year to keep these health care clinics open for the indigent population. Uh, we just restored an, a significant amount of money into these health and human resource safety net programs that had previously been cut. Uh, so I think those are some, some pretty significant examples of where if you believe that education is the most important core responsibility of government and then looking out for your most vulnerable citizens is important, uh, the Senate budget did a marvelous job of it. And it wasn't just because the 20 Republicans voted for it. The, the, my Democratic friends have not criticized that part of the budget. Uh, so I just, I'm a little perplexed why you don't vote for a piece of legislation, even though you, you like it, you embrace it, and you help construct it. All right. Do you, uh, a lot of the focus, I think, of the Republican caucus this year has been on the economy and making sure that Virginia is coming through this recession in a strong way. Uh, tell us about some of the things that uh, the Republicans have been doing on the caucus side to, to help advance the economy this session. Well, I think it's been a collaborative effort, Ray, I really do. Uh, Governor McDonnell, I think, set the tone uh, that Virginia needs to continue to be nationally recognized as the best place to do business. I think many times we as legislators forget to remind uh, the citizens that we serve really what an extraordinary state Virginia is. Uh, Virginia is consistently recognized as the best place to do business. Uh, Virginia has been recognized that if you're going to move your corporate headquarters, Virginia is the best state to come to. Virginia has been recognized as having its children educated and best prepared to enter into the workforce. These things don't happen by accident. They, they happen because we embark on a deliberate strategic plan to make Virginia attractive. We're attractive because uh, many of us try uh, very uh, fervently to protect our right to work law. Virginia is the northernmost state with a right to work law which says you don't have to belong to a union shop in order to work in, in Virginia. And that's very attractive. Uh, when a, a corporation is looking to relocate or locate, one of the things that they look at is, there, is what is the educational system for the children of our employees that are coming to that state. And we have an extraordinary K-12 through and higher education system, which is attractive. People don't think frequently that that's part of an economic development strategy, but it is. Sure. Uh, we've increased funding to the Governor's Opportunity Fund. That's money that the Governor has discretion to use to attract uh, industries to come to Virginia, such people as Rolls-Royce, Northrop Grumman, uh, Al Trio, uh, Mead West Vaco, uh, just to mention um, a few. So that's part of the strategy is using the resources to attract and market Virginia to these corporations who may be looking to, to come to Virginia. So we've really gone through a whole range of, of proactive legislation to try to continue to promote Virginia as a wonderful place uh, to do business. And we've been very, very successful uh, in recent years. We, we've had some very tangible and identifiable successes. I mean, right here in Richmond in recent years, you can look down there by the, the James where we've had Dominion Virginia Power, which has been a, been a corporate citizen for many years, but then right down the street from it, you have Mead West Vaco, which uh, built an extraordinary facility there and came to Virginia. Out in the West End, uh, Al Trier, which used to be Philip Morris, left New York City to move their corporate headquarters to Virginia. Last year, Northrop Grumman, we were competing against Maryland uh, for Northrop Grumman to relocate from California, and they made the decision to come to Virginia. So we have proven successes which show that the money we have invested 
and economic development is paying dividends and it is paying dividends multifold. Right. We have a few minutes left, but I wanted to, you, you touched on the point of your experience as a conferee, and, and that's going to be uh, crucial uh, in the coming days coming up. Uh, tell us a little bit about behind the scenes. What's it like to be a conferee? Uh, it is it is absolute uh, chaos, <laughs> um, and some of my my colleagues who are budget conferees probably wouldn't appreciate that characterization. Uh, it is another experience that one cannot relate verbally. It is on-the-job training, and it is literally uh, learning by baptismal fire. I can tell you, what happens is when the Senate of Virginia and the House of Delegates of Virginia can't agree on a budget. Rather than having 140 delegates and senators work on the budget, it's reduced down to a smaller group. It may be eight to ten, uh, and those those individuals are charged with reconciling the budget. Uh, very long hours, very late hours. Now some very spirited discussions go on because the House of Delegates has their priorities in their budget, and the Senate has a different set of priorities. So what you have to do is, in essence, negotiate out those, those priorities. You, you start pairing the issues up. Okay, uh, members of the House, we will go with you on this particular issue and accept your position on funding, but you need to accept the Senate's position on this funding. Uh, as I mentioned, I was an English history major at, at VMI, so numbers haven't always uh, been my strong suit. But I think what I do bring personally to the uh, budget conference process is I have been known over the years in the General Assembly as a, as a guy who likes to make deals and can make deals. And I'm pretty good at developing a consensus. And I don't mean a consensus through being argumentative or vitriolic, that I think I'm a pretty reasonable person. And, and I can, can sit down with my house colleagues and intellectually have a discussion with them but also I'm willing to make the deal. But it has been uh, one of the most interesting experience, not just of my legislative life, but of my entire life. Mm -hmm. If I try to go home and tell my family about a budget conference process, they look at me in total disbelief. Uh, and, you know, Dad, let's talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> well, become, you come, there are so few, you all become the focal point of uh, a lot of the lobbying corps and uh, a lot of uh, the special interests around the state to make sure that their voice is heard and that you take those issues to the table. I thought I had a lot of friends in the General Assembly. The first year I was a budget conferee, gosh, I became at least superficially popular uh, for maybe a compressed week period of time. Uh, but uh, I don't say that taking offense at it. Um, the lobbying community has a job to do. That's their responsibility is to either advocate uh, their employers' issues or to defend against issues that are, are not uh, beneficial to them. So uh, those of us on the budget conference understand that and, and don't uh, take the, uh, the short-term friendships as being disingenuous. It's just part of the job, and nobody makes us be a budget conferee, believe me. You right. can always say no. Right. Well, Senator, I appreciate uh, you joining us today. It's been a fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it a lot. So thank you. Well, Ray, thank you very much for having me. All right. And thank you for watching this edition of Cable Reports from the General Assembly. I'm Ray Lamira. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.